I've got two subjects. The first one is win more customers and contracts at higher margins. It's basically a program on developing customer relationships and improving your odds of winning the work. The second part is basically a, a, a how to be a great leader, manager, manage your crew, manage your team. So uh, we're going to do two parts. About an hour, hour and 15 each, there's going to be a break. They'll have some refreshments in, a few, in, about, in an hour or so. And then we'll get going and we'll go till we're done. Uh, I'll stay here as long as uh, there's still people here. How's that? I know some of you have got to hit the, uh, hit the road soon, but uh, we'll do our best to make sure. And if you can't see me, there's a lots of seats up front. Uh, the uh, stage is kind of a weird scenario for me, so I'm going to work from down here. So if you want to see better, come on down, as they say. All right, so my slides are back here. Oh, I got to go up here and turn them on. Okay, win more customers and contracts at higher margins. That's where we're going to start today. Uh, and uh, I already walked you through that yesterday. It's going to be a little crazy here. I got to keep turning around. Maybe I'll move over here. Right in front of the video. How's that? Okay, so. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, playing golf at Sedona, Arizona, another red rock, beautiful area, and I get a cell phone call. Hey, George, this is Kurt Miller, Pacific Gulf Properties. Uh, we, we just signed a lease for a brand new building, an uh, 80,000 square foot build-a-suit for Amscam International in Anaheim, California, right off the 5 freeway. Uh, we have a meeting with the architect Monday at 10 a.m. Uh, can you make it, and do you want to be our contractor? Heck yeah, I'll be there. So, you know, finished my golf, had a little celebration, and Monday morning, 10 o'clock, I'm on the team. So that's what I want you to think about. How do you get those phone calls? How do you get those phone calls where people call you and say, you're my contractor, you're my plumbing contractor, you're my heating contractor? Now, he never said, what's your fee? He didn't say, what's your price? He didn't say, what's your you know, how many bids you're going to get. He didn't say, how much you're going to charge. He just said, you're my contractor. So if, go back about two, three years prior. I made a personal decision in my business in 1985, my construction general contracting business, to s focus on five or six customers that I could build deep relationships with, what I could build a loyal, trusted relationship with. Rather than bid a lot of contractors and be proud of the fact that I have all repeat customers. You know what a repeat customer is, right? Somebody who uses you when you're cheap versus uses you when they want to use you and they don't get other prices. So what I made a decision is to seek loyal customers who would use us at least 50% of the time. I can't expect them to give me all their work. So I, I, I set out on a process to change our company. I went from a bidding company to a negotiated construction company. And what I tried to do was focus on five or six really great customers who do a lot of work on a regular basis. Uh, and, and for me, a developer is perfect because they're going to build a lot of projects. That's their business is building uh, industrial parks, office parks, uh, multifamily uh, and, uh, facilities, uh, retail facilities, who do a lot of them, and, uh, or hotels uh, here, here in town, there's a lot of hotels, and uh, that, that's why I changed my business model. So I had three estimators, I went down to one, but then I made a personal decision to dedicate a lot of time and energy into customer relationships. So I joined the best golf club in town, the best country club in town. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, it cost a couple grand a month for dues. Yeah, it cost a hundred grand plus to join, but that's where I'm gonna take my customers. I got front row seats at the Pacific Symphony, which is in Orange County, California, which is a front row center for the Pop Series. Uh, I bought Anaheim Ducks hockey tickets, uh, four seats right there. And so that total investment cost me, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 grand a year. But for that, I was able to build a great business, change my business to a, you know, make my business great again kind of thinking, and reduce my cost, reduce my overhead, reduce my bidding stress and ha hassle. And, and also, as a subset of that, I was able to seek 
really good subcontractors, plumbing, heating, mechanical contractors, that I trusted who could work with me on negotiated jobs, on a design build, design assist basis. So that's what I want you to think about, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Do I want to continue my business as a low bid contractor, or do I want to upgrade my, my selection process of how I select and they select our, our company to build their project? I'm not saying get rid of everything and just do this. I'm saying I want you to add this to your book of tricks, to your bag of, uh, of, of arrows that you shoot to attract customers. Because the average contractor doesn't spend any money on customer development. They do work and they hope to get a phone call. They, they wait for the plan room to come out from the builder's exchange uh, or the Dodge reports or the BB bid or whatever comes out and that's their sales process. Then they turn in their bid and hope somebody calls. That is not being proactive. That's just waiting for something to happen. So I want you to think about, if you implemented a little bit of what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes, how would it potentially help your business, right? So we're going to start, uh, everybody's got one of these worksheets. If you don't, there's plenty up here in the front. Uh, Dave printed quite a few. So we're going to start on page two. And just think about your company and what can I do to build a better business uh, a stronger business over the next uh, year or so. Especially while the economy is still good. This is the best time to do it. Uh, as soon as the economy sputters a little bit, it's going to be harder and harder because these developers and repeat customers are going to be, take a little uh, harder and more effort. So, so just an aside, when I work with subcontractors, specialty contractors like yourselves, most of you in the room, uh, what do I recommend? If you're in a town, Salt Lake, it's a big town. I don't know how many people are there, there's a lot of people. Uh, it, it, so, uh, here in uh, St. George, I don't know how many people are, 100,000. It's busy, but there are general contractors that you could work for that negotiate their work. There are them. You just, you, potentially you're not working for them, why? Because you've got to build a relationship. So there are some customers in your market that will do what we're talking about here. You just got to go attack them. They're not going to. They're not calling you. Why? They're happy. So you've got to get in and make them happier, right? So so let's think about how we do it. So as we get started, um, you know, there's too much competition. Uh, uh, so wait a minute. I skipped ahead. Okay, here we go. So what I'm trying to do is come up with a winning proposal strategy. Winning proposal strategy. Hold on a minute here. Uh, my clicking's off. Hang on a minute here. What's going on here? Did I get the right slideshow up? Let me just jump ahead here. Uh, hold on. Sorry. Oh, something's not adding up here. One second. I might, I might have clicked the wrong slide. Sorry, I should be ready. <laughs> I spent all morning getting ready. Uh, again, I double checked. Okay, one second. Um, yeah, that, that's correct. Okay, so I'm good. Sorry. I tricked myself. Okay, there we go. So what I'm looking for are, are potential clients that are going to offer me more work, that are going to uh, always call me, always give me a, a last look, award me more work, give me work at my price, be loyal to me, negotiate with me, and worst case, best case, give me last look. So, so what I have to do is I have to be more than minimum per plans and specs. I gotta, I gotta be more proactive attracting customers, and I gotta increase my sales and marketing program from waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for the, for the bid reports to come out, waiting for the government to spit out jobs, et cetera. So what am I going to do to make that happen? So if I look at the future, the problem is the total capacity of all our contractors and all our competitors is significantly more than the market. The market is less than the number of contractors. So pretty much everybody here is busy, but always can do more, right? And so look at your company. You're in the middle of this pie. How do I get a bigger piece of the pie? I can either lower my price or build customer relationships or set myself apart as a different specialty niche expert in a certain marketplace. 
So there's several options here. It's not just lower your price. It's customer relationships. It's be the certified expert who can do work on nuclear power plants or, uh, or power company facilities with a safety record and an IS net world rating of 97 or higher. Or you're a MATOC or a SATOC approved contractor. Or you're a DBE, WBE, MBE, SVBBO. What can you do to set yourself apart to reduce competition? That's what I want you to think about. So the capacity is, is more than the work. So how do I get an edge? So I have to do something different than my competitors. If I'm not willing to do something different than my competitors, I only have one option, lower my price to get work. But if I am different, I'm better, I add more value, I add more engineering technology services, I'm certified, I'm drug tested, my, my people can go in a secure area secured by the government that you have to have credentials, you have to have driver's licenses, you have to have 40 hours a year of certified training, then I can set myself apart from the competition. So what do I have to do? I have to look for new opportunities and I have to seek higher margin customers and projects. So think about what else I can do that I'm currently not doing. Better customers that have less bidders, better opportunities that has a high barrier to entry. I always say the, higher it, uh, the harder it is to get in, the less competition and the higher margin. The easier it is to get on the bid list, the lower the markup, the lower the margins, and the more competition. Why? Anybody can get on a public works job. Anybody can get on a school job. Anybody can get on a fill-in-the-blank job. Anybody can get on a general contractor bidding against seven other general contractors. Anybody can get on those lists. But if somebody's got a design-build project for a new facility, they're not going to get 12 bids. They're going to get the team they want. And, 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 and why? That's how general contractors work. I'm a general. Uh, I build commercial buildings, uh, 1 million to 10 million. I build lots of them, 50 million a year in sales for 20 years in a row. And, and I negotiated every job. I rarely bid work once I changed my program. And I wanted a team of one or two or maximum three subcontractors, plumbing, heating, mechanical contractors, fire sprinkler contractors, that I could work with. And I kind of spread it out, because I don't want it all, in one, all my eggs in one basket. So, so you know, you're going to get one, you're going to get one. You're, you're the right guy for this job. You're the right team for that job. You're the right company for this job. Some medical. Okay, let's bring in, you know, this company, because they're really good with medical work. This is a multifamily with retail on the bottom. Let's bring in these guys, because they're really good at multifamily. So, so that's how I work, and that's, that's, there's plenty of that work out there. Now, why am I able to not go with low bid? As a general contractor, I have a AIA A201 general contract. You all know what that is, right? My contract is an AIA 201. You know what that is, right? You don't? You gotta know what your customer's contracts are, right? It's not lump sum. It's an open book negotiated contract where I show all the bids to my customer and we work as a team to select the subcontractors so we get the best team for the job. Then I add it up, then I put my fee on it. My fee is fixed. I don't get more money with a bigger fee. It's a fixed fee. And then we put a guaranteed max and at the end of the job, whatever we save, we split. Why would I hire a low bidder on that case? Because all I want to do is make my fee and not have it go over the guaranteed max. So we got to, first of all, we've got to understand how our customers do business. If you don't even know what kind of contract they have and what kind of contract they're working under, you just think they're all selling, selling low price and need to hire the low bidder. They don't. Construction managers never go with the low bidder. They go with the best qualified team for the project. So I want you to think about how you do business and how you get business. Now certain industries, if you're in the home building business, they just they tell you the price and you're stuck with it, right? There's no money there. But if you're in the commercial world, there is a good percentage of the work that's not based on low price. 
it's based on performance, relationships, trust, those kinds of things. So I want you to think about in your market, who else should I be going after? And I'm going to talk about the chicken list. Who are you too chicken to call on? Well, they've already used them. Well, yeah, why aren't they using you? Well, I haven't ever gone and seen them. Well, what are you going to do if you go see them? Well, I'm going to go, uh, you better have a program when you get there. You better look good, smell good, act good, talk good. You better know what you're doing, right? And so what are you going to do to get more work? That's the key. So the reason we don't get more work, uh, better work, higher margin work, is we don't have a, uh, we don't have a, uh, uh, you know, we stay stuck on the low bid treadmill, right? Uh, and we don't have a written business plan. Uh, we, we stay stuck. We, we don't have a written uh, marketing and sales program, a customer relationship, a differentiating factor plan to get us in the right places. We have no plan. We have no outreach. The only outreach is, here's my bid. How do I look, right? And so we have no sales plan. We have no business development plan. We have no customer list that we go and see on a regular basis. We, our website hasn't been updated in years. Uh, what else? Uh, we don't have uh, uh, anything different. The only thing different about you is your price. You do good work, you do good quality, and you try to finish on time and you're safe, right? So why, are, why should I hire you? Well, because we're really good. Well, who isn't? Nobody ever told me there, you know, you get three, schedule, quality, or price. You know, that's expected. When you bid a job, you're expected to be really good, really fast, really quality, and safe, right? You're supposed, that's what you're expected to do. That's the minimum to get in the game, to buy a ticket. So now what, what sets you apart? And if you just answer that one question, your company will explode. Because I can't tell by talking to you why I should hire you. I like you, you're a nice person. Oh, well let's exploit that then, right? And so what do I do to, uh, what do I do about bid follow-up? Most contractors have no bid follow-up program, zero. You turn in a bid and you wait for the phone to ring. That's your marketing and sales program. Wait for phone to ring. Look at these suppliers here. How many suppliers and vendors are still here? They all leave, they all pack up and leave. We're all contractors here. What, look, look how, how much money do you think they spend to get your business so you only buy from them? How much money do you spend to get your customer's business so they only buy from you? The average is zero. The average is zero. When's the last time you took your, your best five customers to a ball game or to lunch and said thanks? And if the answer is not very often, you're selling price. So if you want to get better, you've got to do something different. You've got to have a plan in place. A simple plan, which I'll cover later too, you know, just to kind of jump ahead, a simple plan, list out your top 10 customers and make it, put them on the calendar and make sure you go see two a week. Boom. Five weeks from now, you'll see all 10. And then just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Take them to lunch, take them to a ball game, take them fishing, take them to golfing, whatever you do. Do something, invite them to a, a, a dinner meeting, invite them to a concert, out to dinner with your spouses, whatever, right? Do something, instead of just turn in more bids and hope and pray that your price is cheap, right? So what are we gonna do to get our different businesses? So, so uh, what's your reason for not doing that, right? So we gotta get off the low bid treadmill. Here's what happens when you're on the low, ooh, that's loud. Here's the low bid treadmill. Whoa! Whoa! This is uh, from an ad. There we go. Well, we try again. Let's bid them again. Whoa! Okay. So there's the low bid treadmill. You just keep getting beat up and you keep spending money, right? So, so here's the low bidder. Here's the low bid ski team. Here's the low bid bass boat. Here's the low bid uh, hunting dog. I love that guy. Here's the low bid car lock. Here's the low bid uh, hunter. Here's the low bid uh, police force. Here's the low bid horseshoe team. Here's the low bid uh, birthday cake. And my favorite, the low bid hot tub party. There we go. Okay, pretty gross, huh? All right, so what, what, I'm not saying you can't sell cheap uh, Walmart does a pretty good job, don't they? Yeah, they, they do okay. They're, and they're the low bid pr provider, right? So what I want to do, 
uh, I don't want to have a, a job sign that says the low bidder. This is a client, a client's competitor of our, of, I have a client in San Francisco area. This is, this is their number one competitor's water truck. It's unbelievable. That they, we are the low bidder. That's not their name, but they proud themselves as, we're the low bidder. <laughs> oh, God. You know. Anyway, so what do we got to do here? So what do we got to do to increase profitable sales? Increase possible sales. So we, so we need to go after jobs that have less competition. So less competition, what has less competition? Uh, generally, it's a high barrier to entry. You got to be safety certified. You got to have drug testing. You got to be uh, uh, extreme qualifications for your employees. A minimum training requirement. I just read uh, on the ENR, Engineering News Record, uh, I'm on their email blast. They do a, a news flash every morning. Yesterday I read that the major companies are going to start requiring a minimum amount of training per employee, contractor, subcontractors. And it's around 40 hours a year of training. And if you don't have that, you're not going to get to bid their work or to do their work. What else is a high barrier to entry? You're the sole provider for a certain kind of product. You have an exclusive in your area for a certain kind of system, product, service, whatever it is, right? Uh, what else? Uh, your, uh, you, we could spend hours thinking about ideas, but what could you do to break through a high barrier to entry? Just, pres just getting in front of somebody with a video presentation, we were talking about videos earlier with the video people, uh, uh, you know, You've got a video on your website that welcomes them to your opportunity. You have a video of certain kind of projects that you present on your, on your website. It piques people's interest. It gets them interested in you rather than, oh God, another plumber, commercial, industrial, electrical, one call does it all, bonded, licensed, insured, blah, who cares? Everybody does that, right? Quality first, well, duh, right? Safety first, duh, who cares? Everybody's got that. What's your differentiating factor, right? You know, or we can go after higher margin work. You know, night work, weekend work. I, I, built a, uh, I built a lot of Costco's. You have Costco's here, right? Costco's. I built all the Costco's in Southern California. There were price clubs converted. Them. They're all at night. Every one of them was at night. I have a, one of my best clients, you know, I'm uh, golden, right? They, they do blood transfusion center remodels on the weekend. Half a million dollars and about 100,000 of it's plumbing, in three days. And get, what do you think their markups are? That guy does like 500 grand and makes 200 grand on one job. I mean, it's like, it, they're, they're the only people who do it. And he has a team. He doesn't bid it out. He's got the same plumber on every job, right? And, and uh, uh, Jason, right, Coleman. And uh, I mean, what else can you do to see car margin work? We remodel all the Costco's at night. You know, that's, that's a lot of work. <coughs> <coughs> we got to get people there on the weekend, and it's hard. <coughs> we talked about loyal customers. Loyal means, it's kind of like when you get married. Right, guys? You put a wedding ring on. Anybody here married or happily married, knows somebody who's married? We're married, used to be married, still married. What, whatever, right? Didn't mean to get too personal there. Uh, hey, by the way, how many of you told your spouse this was a four-day, uh, uh, excuse me, a two-week uh, conference? Couple guys, okay. But when you put a wedding ring on, you stop dating other people, right? Right? We're not sure, right? Okay, right, okay, good. So it's like when, you, when you're loyal, you use them. You hire them. You trust them, right? It's all about trust, right? So loyal. Uh, and then steady work opportunities. What are some steady work opportunities? I would love to work for the GSA, Government Services Association, or the federal government. Why? Because once you're in, you're in. And you get on their maintenance list. And any, uh, one of my clients in Reno just got a contract with the city of Reno. They get every job under 30000 for the city. What do you think their markups are on that? It's like 40%. It's like great work. Uh, so. Oh, but it's so hard. Who wants to work for the government? All that paperwork. <laughs> Just hire somebody for 40% markup on about $4 million a year. 
Do the math. I can hire a lot of people to push paper around, right? So we, we shy away from the hard jobs, high barrier to entry, high margin work, because it's hard. Everybody, hard, see? When it's hard, there's lots of cash, right? So think about it, steady workflow. What happens when the economy is good, we stop going after service work. We stop going after long-term maintenance contracts, annual contract work. Why? Because we're busy on the big job making like 1% net. Instead of the little jobs where you make 40% gross and you make 15% net, and you just put somebody in charge of it and let them run with it, right? So, so there's so many opportunities here. And what are we doing about our follow-up and sales? You know, what do you do? When you turn in a bid, that's step one of three to get the contract. When you estimate the job, that you're one-third done with your work. Now we have to go get the work, and then we've got to negotiate the contract. So you need to spend just as much time getting the work as bidding the work. So I know you spend a whole week bidding a job, right? Big job. And how much time do you spend on follow-up? Being aggressive, going seeing them, camping out in their front office, you know, sending them emails, sending them photos, inviting them places, whatever you can do to get in front of your customers, right? How much time do you spend that? Well, you don't. You just, hey, Susie, you know, your, your office manager, hey, Susie, uh, can you call and see if the results are out yet on that job? Is that sales? No, that's like stupid. Stupid. I make you wear this sign if you could tell me that's your sales program. Stupid. There we go. Stupid. That's stupid. Right? And you're all going, yeah, I guess so. I don't know if I want to admit I'm stupid. Right? So the question is, or lastly, you can wait for the phone to ring. And, you know, hopefully people send you off jobs to bid. Uh, and uh, hopefully your Google works. I, we had a guy at our last uh, peer group meeting. Uh, um, I think, I think it was the other one. You weren't there, Ryan. It was the other one. And the guy, it's his first time there, and he's a young techie guy, about 26. And I'm the number one great, ra rated Google contractor for commercial office tenant improvements in my city. How many office building owners Google for a contractor? Like zero. <laughs> it's all referrals, right? You know, I'm not Googling for a commercial plumber to build an office building. <laughs> Right? And so, I, I, I don't want to do that. Okay, so what are we going to do? So the question is, oh, here's one. I get those all the time. Bay Area Hospital, yada, yada, yada. This one's in Oregon. You know, contact me and I'll, you get those, right? I square foot or whatever you get, right? BB bid, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, Blue book, whatever, right? We all get those. So that's your sales program. We're hoping somebody sends me something. That doesn't work, right? Okay, so we've got to have a strategy. So on the page there too, right in the top left middle. Uh, so what are we going to do here? Draft your winning business development estimating, sales estimating, bid and proposal strategy right there in the middle. Okay, so what are we going to do? Uh, think about it. So you have some choices. So we have to decide how I want to do business. How do I want to do business? Do I want to be the cheap bidding contractor? Great, let's just do that. Do I want to be the value added? This is on, uh, somebody's looking here, page two. Uh, halfway down, draft your winning, page two. Uh, okay, so, so you have a choice how you want to do business and what's your uh, pecking order of priority. Because I want to focus on the top priorities and less on the low priorities. To me, low bid is low priority. So, so I, I created for my company a, a steps to success or a proposal strategy. So my first priority is to negotiate or do design build. I don't know what yours is, these are mine. My second priority is to be the only bidder. You're starting to see the trend here? The third priority is to get last look. Now I don't know if you call that ethical or not, that's just reality, right? If I have a relationship, I'm gonna be able to sit down with a customer and they're gonna give me the opportunity to do the job at a price. Whatever you call that, I don't care. They're saying, we really want to use you. Uh, you've got everything we need. Can you do it for 100 grand? Now, it's my, my decision, right? I don't want them to call me and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Can't use you. We just awarded it to somebody else. 
Because when I'm not calling them and they're not calling me back, what are they doing? They're sitting down with who they want to use and giving them my prices. And that other company's got your work because they have the in, they have the relationship, right? So if they're not calling you, they're negotiating with somebody else. Why? Because they want to use the other company, not you. Why? You're still, you're all good. You're just not their preferred because they don't know you, trust you, like you, think you're the right company. You don't have any extra value. You change your order to death. You're underfunded. You don't have enough crews. Whatever's happened in the past, it's ticked them off or it's given you a bad vibe. Uh, number four, I want to have, uh, before I bid a job, uh, is there a potential that I can build a loyal customer relationship and get ongoing work from them on a high bid hit win ratio basis? Next, is there a repeat? Some companies just, you know, there's a lot of jobs. So, yeah, it's okay, it's better than nothing, right? And then we're getting down here. What are your bid odds? What bid odds are you willing to go after work? You know, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 100 to 1. Uh, there's a company I work with up in Spokane. Uh, I was looking at their, he sent me their, uh, he hired me to help him win more work, basically. And uh, he's a really good company. He's just not getting any work. Why? Because they're bidding a whole bunch, a lot, hundreds, 200 public works jobs a year. And we, I looked at their win ratio, their bid hit win ratio. We looked at it together. And out of 100 job bids, and I'm not exaggerating, the last 100 jobs they bid on public jobs, they got one. One. And they got it, and they lost money. <laughs> but they're busy bidding. So, you know, but on their private work, they bid 20, and they got... I don't know, about eight. Their whole volume was on eight jobs. Well, what does that tell you? We've got to be more proactive to get work. And so what's your bid odds, and, and how many bidders are you willing to bid against? When I changed my philosophy, I said, if there's more than three, I'm not interested. It's just a waste of time. My bid hit ratio, I want to keep it around one out of three, not one out of 12. First of all, I gotta know what it is, and then I gotta track it, right? Okay, so those are some ideas for you. I know I'm kicking you a little hard here, and I know some cities, you don't have a choice. There only is public jobs, but there's sometimes negotiated add-on public work, too. And maybe there's other entities. What about the power companies? What about the phone companies? What about the gas company? I have uh, one of my really good clients does a whole bunch of work with a gas utility company putting in underground pipes. And he makes a fortune. He made, I don't know, he did 40 million last year and he made, I think he made 9 million or something. I mean, it's like crazy money, right? Uh, and, uh, but he did it by working hard to get in with the gas company, right? So there's more than just whatever you do, right? Okay, so next thing I have to have is a target. People say, help me get more work. I say, okay, so how are we gonna do work? How are we gonna get it? And who are we gonna go after? and then we'll decide how to market it, right? So here's my targets. First of all, I, I've got to decide project types. What project types bring me high margins? What projects type is a waste of time? Project types. What markets? Well, you know, in the developer market or the, or the multifamily market or this county or this area. I want to stay within this area. Well, hopefully there's enough work there, right? If not, we've got to expand. A guy sent me an email out of way up in North Dakota somewhere. He says, I'm the best ceramic tile guy in the state. There's, I just can't get any work. I Googled this town. It's like, it's like Salina. It's got like four people there. It's like, there's one guy with a house. Okay, you did his house. There's no more work. Move. <laughs> Move to, move to Utah or uh, wherever where it's growing, right? Uh, customers. What kind of customers will hire you on a high return basis? Not shop you, but will hire you. So what general contractors, if you work for generals, for example, uh, don't bid. They negotiate. They do design build. They use AIA, AIA contract 201 cost of the work plus a fee with a guaranteed maximum price. 
Which contractors are on a CM negotiated design build basis versus bid contractors? You know, even the big guys in town, you know, the big generals and national generals, they have, they have bid work, CM work, and negotiated work. Well, you go after the negotiated work is what you do, and how you get there is you buy your way in. They've got to get to know, like, and trust you before they'll give you the, give you the, low, the low competition work, right? So what kind of customers should I go after? Those who pay, those who don't. Those who shop, those who don't. You know, all those kinds of questions, right? Uh, uh, who's easy to work with? Who has good supervision? Who doesn't? Because bad supervision really kills you, right? They bring you in seven times and, you know, you're never, never ready for you. Contract types, T&M, cost plus, all those kinds of things. So, by the way, uh, you know, kind of another aside, when you start a job, do you hand your customer your T&M rates? You have to. And those need to be really high, right? So when you sign a subcontract, you staple your T&M rates to that contract. That's how you increase your margins. It's another way. You don't do the work and negotiate later. You tell them up front your fair rates. Get what I mean by that? Trying to be ethical here. Trying to be, have integrity, right? Well, fair is what you can get, right? Fair is what's the, in the marketplace. You, you just Google uh, 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 prevailing wage, take off five bucks, and you're done. That's it. You know, why should you not get what a union contractor makes, right? Just because you're open shop doesn't mean you're cheaper. You're just as good. You provide the same work. You have the same health care benefits, everything else, right? Okay, contract types. Project sizes. What size jobs are you best at? So if you're really good at a $100,000 job, when you get a $5,000 add-on job, what's your markup on the $5,000? Well, it should be double, triple what it is on the $100,000, right? To get the $100,000 or $200,000 job, you have to be significantly lower markup then on a guy just calls you up and say, can you come fix my whatever? You're going to be almost 100% markup on that because that's a lot of work to make $12, right? We want to make $300 on that, right? Profit, uh, profit. So what's your margin? How low will you go? What should you get on a high rate basis, right? And, uh, uh, and who, where is the job and who will you bid against? Who won't you bid against? How many of you have somebody in the room here you, you just hate bidding against? I know you won't raise your hand because they're probably sitting right next to you, but you know, some guys just have a low bid reputation and some guys are fair. I don't want to bid against the cheapos. It's a waste of time, right? What's the point? You don't quit bidding. One of the guys says, yeah, but I like to keep my estimator busy. Make him wear the stupid sign again. No, have him, have him go call on people. Have him get out. Have him upgrade your estimating cost, your job cost. Have him go out to a job. Walk the job with a foreman and Learn how to estimate right, right? Get them out of the office, right? Lots of things you can do. So it's what I call a bid grid sieve. What job should I go after? What should I not go after? So we have a bid, no bid sieve meeting every Monday to go over the potential jobs, the past jobs, all those kinds of jobs, and we decide what should we go after and what shouldn't we go after. When do we need work? We have a, we have a project flow chart with all our jobs on it so we can look at when do we need work, when do we, we're already loaded, we, we only want to go after high margin work. We don't want to work for these guys because our bid hit ratio is one out of 40. We get one out of 40 and then we lose money on them. We shouldn't bid them at all, just, just tell them no. Yeah, but, uh, no, just get over it, right? I'd rather do no work than terrible work, right? That doesn't even cover my overhead. So, so I, gotta, I gotta have a sieve. What's your sieve? Do you have a sieve? Do you have a bid, no bid, customer, yes, no, sieve, where the gold nuggets fall through? So I want to go after the gold nuggets. That's where I want to spend my time. But sometimes I've got to keep busy, too. So I can, I can do some cheap work as an entry to get in with the good guys and gals. Or I can just do it because, you know, we're, we do okay in that. But I want to go after a higher margin brand of work as well, right? So that's what I want you to think about. Uh, and, and I mentioned the chicken list. What about the companies you're too chicken to call on? I know you've got somebody that you sh haven't gone after because you're too chicken to go call on them, right? I know you got one, right? Come on, Ryan, you got one, right? 
<laughs> yeah, we do. We all got a chicken list. I drove by Irvine Company's headquarters. They're the biggest developer in Orange County. I drove right by their office every day on my way to my office. Every day for 20 years. I never got off, turn, turned off the car and got, walked up the building and tried to get in front of the construction uh, manager in the company. They do about probably 800 million a year in construction. I didn't get one job out of them. Why? Because I kept driving by. And, oh, I don't, oh, it's hard. Uh, they, they're all kind of formal and, you know. So, kept driving by. They're my chicken list, right? There's other guys doing all their work. Well, they're already set with those guys. They're probably not going to get in anyway. You always talk yourself out of all the reasons, right? Okay, so that's what I want you to think about. Okay, so before I can help you market, I have to know who you're going after and how you want to do business, right? So there we go. So then I've got to figure out what's a great customer. What's a great customer? So, I, so, so now I've got kind of what I want. Now, I've to, now I have to create a target list, and I've got to create an action plan to get them to call me first. Call me last. Negotiate with me. So I've got to have some sort of plan to get people to know me. Right? There's a, is that SR? Is that SR there? Oh, no, it's AIM. Uh, uh, you know, I can sell price. I can sell uh, service, drive through I can sell, uh, uh, oh, I love this guy. Drop your pants here, and you'll see prompt attention. You know? Whatever you can do to get people to remember you, right? Uh, okay, you can, you're okay. Uh, or maybe you're always open, except now you're closed. Right? We're, t we're full service. We just don't work weekends. You can't call me on a weekend, right? Uh, uh, I love this guy. He's in uh, northern Michigan. Teddy Griffin Roadhouse, fine food, cocktails, lodging. Better food than most hospitals. So anyway, he, he makes you think, right? What do you do to make your customers remember you, right? Uh, full service. They got everything, right? And of course, last but not least, uh, oh, there's a good one. That's in Indiana, and uh, this is my favorite one. This is a guy, he's focused, he knows what he wants. He's uh, research, right? So uh, anyway, so we gotta define what kind of customers you wanna go after. I want recurring, high margin, negotiate, low competition, don't shop. That's what I want, what do you want? Then my job size, I'm good over a million bucks. A million to five million is my my wheelhouse. What's your wheelhouse? When you do the small jobs, you're bidding against the, the small guys who tend to have cheaper rates. When you're bidding against the big guys, their overhead's lower than yours, so you're not going to get the work because they're, they're going to be cheaper. Their markup's going to be less. So you've got to know your market. You know, uh, I can almost tell you what your overhead is just by your size of company because I survey all the companies that I work with and I know if you're doing about four or five million, your overhead's around a million bucks. 800 to a million too. And I know your markup's around 15, 16%. I know if you only do a million dollars, your markup's like 20, 25%. Why? Because you've got to pay yourself and your office and your staff. That alone is 250 to 400 grand. Well, on a million dollars, that's 40% just for that. So you've got to be higher on the uh, higher as a smaller contractor. So, so you know, you got to know your competition and how they mark up their jobs, right? So I want great customers to call me, so i got to go after the right customers. So uh, anyway, so whatever kind of contract you're on, you, I was reading an engineering news record uh, about, uh, about getting work. Customers use low-cost providers because they haven't given them any reason not to. You know, contractors hire cheap because they don't see any difference. Everybody's minimum per plan suspects. You're all good, you're all good quality, you're all good people, so what's your price, right? And so are you different? And so when you're the same, are you really different? Are you really different? Uh, uh, are you different? Are, th are you the same? Uh, when I look at your website, it says quality service pro uh, schedule, Save, they all say the same. Why should I hire you? There's no video on there with you talking about how we like to build relationships and trust. We take care of our customers. It's just a bunch of words on a page. You know, your proposal is, is black and white ink after I print it on white paper. There's no, the only reason to hire you is the little number at the bottom that says how much, right? There's no reason to hire you except for price. Uh, unless I have a differentiating factor, right? And so, uh, 
the same is, uh, when you're the same, you have minimum margins, minimum chance, minimum success. So the real question is, as we sit here, why should I hire you? What set your company apart from the competition so you don't have to compete on price? So you really got to sit down and ask yourself that. Why should I hire you? And if you can't tell me, if you go, if you say the same thing everybody else says, service, quality, value, you know, full value, full service, on time, who doesn't? Why should I hire you? You're either the only one out there, like an app iPhone, well now you've got Samsung, et cetera, but you either got the premier product that's known in the marketplace, or you're just like everybody else, right? So I've got to answer myself. So most companies have this motto, cash only, absolutely no checks, give us money right now, we hit you, go away. Uh, and uh, hey, well that's everybody's motto. We're, hey, we're, we're no worse than our competition. You know, why should we do more than the contract? They're not paying us for that. We shouldn't have to do more. You know, we shouldn't have to do more. They're only paying us for that. Well, okay, sell cheap, that's fine. Okay, any questions, any comments? Hopefully I've encouraged you to think about a few things here. Nobody's left yet, that's a good sign, right? Okay, let's turn to page uh, three and just keep going with some more ideas. And uh, zip through some ideas here on this page. And uh, okay, so what do we got to do? So, so that doesn't work. So you can wait for the profitable work to get easier to get, which ain't going to happen. You have to do something different. Like I said yesterday, you've got to do something different. You've got to get out of your chair. You've got to make it a priority to get work. Get work is the business owner's top priority after, after people. I'll, se second session I'm doing on people, so I'll tell you it's people then. But right now, your job description is to get work, high margin work, and find, attract, and maintain, train people. That's your top two. How many business owners here? Quite a few, right? Yeah, almost all of us. So that's your top priority. Who's the best salesman in your company? You are, salesperson, saleswoman. You are. It's not your estimator. Most estimators can't, you know, drool when they walk out. You know, they're number people, right? Put them in a cave and just have them spit out numbers. They're not salespeople, right? You're probably thinking of somebody, Ryan, right? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so who's the best salesperson? What percentage of your time should you be out presenting, negotiating, schmoozing with your customer? More than none, right? Okay, so uh, what am I going to do? So I, I saw, saw this guy, another plumbing company. You know, all services, fix or replace, underground, you know, they, you know commercial, residential, Better Business Bureau. You know how much that Better Business Bureau stamp cost? He just Googled it and he printed it and stuck it on his truck. It's free. Probably illegal, but probably cost 200 bucks to get that. Like, who cares? Better business for real. When's the last time they're in your audit, in your office doing an audit? Like, never, right? So what does that mean? So how do I get more new, better business? So what I want you to think about is I'm currently doing this work. It is what it is. It's what I've got. It's my customers. It's how I get work. So how do I get more work with better customers? So I'm not dumping these, I'm going after new, right? So if you're already doing four million, how do we do another million? If you're already doing a million, how do we do another 250,000 in new, better work? I've got to change how I, how I spend my time so I can spend it over here in the higher margin work. That's what I want you to think about here. I don't want you to drop what you're doing and start, start from scratch. It takes time to build that book of business, right? So, so I want you to think about a grand reopening a grand reopening, the high margin, high bid hit ratio division. Okay, so, you know, it's, what is it, April 1st, roughly. Uh, we got nine months or eight months the rest of the year. So for the rest of the year, I'm gonna focus, my personal priority is to focus on finding higher margin customers against less competition, okay? And I'll get the people who I've already got to run the, run the current work, okay? So, so I've got to make a decision. I've got to stop waiting for the phone to ring. 
I've got to get out of my chair. I can't sit and wait for the phone to ring. I can't wait for more government-funded jobs. Uh, uh, unless you're going to focus on a specific niche within the government. We have one of my clients does army ranges. That's all he does. His name is Range Construction. They only do army ranges, but he goes to all the range commander conferences, he lectures, he seminars, he does workshops for the range commanders, the, gen the, ma the majors on the, on the ranges. He, fo he, he really markets the heck out of those guys, and he gets lots of juicy work. He went from 30 million to 60 million last year uh, because he knows so many range managers now. And uh, it's really high margin. He's really killing it. So I'm not saying government's bad. Low bid government's bad, right? So what are we going to go after? We can't wait for the plan rooms to keep sending us plans. I mean, hey, that'll keep the other side of the business going. Uh, yellow page, forget it. Shoppers. People shop for cheap on the yellow pages in Google, right? Uh, you could stand on the corner with this sign, we'll work for food. Uh, or you could stand on the corner with this sign, we'll build for change orders. It's your choice, right? So it's up to you. Uh, uh, you what else can we do? Uh, so, so I want you to think about developing a proactive business development plan, an action plan. If you want to stay simple, pick your top five or ten customers and go see them on a regular basis. You're building a friendship. You're building a trusted relationship. If we want to get to the next level, we can do a postcard mailing, we can do an email blast, we can do home shows, we can do you know, all sorts of stuff. But let's just start with the basics. Uh, build relationships or go after jobs and customers that require high, high barrier to entry, high barrier to entry. It's hard to get in. So it's, I mean, pick one. Or pick them both. Uh, but that's where, you're gonna, that's where the nuggets are. That's where the gold is, right? So I need to build a plan. I've got to have how I do work and who am I going to go after. How I want to do work, who am I going to go after. And then I can attack. And I've got to create a list. So, so think about hockey. I know some of you are, anybody here a hockey fan? I know uh, Na Nashville? Who's your team, Ryan? Oh, I like Colorado. Colorado. Avalanche, that's right. That's the last time I saw him, he was wearing an Avalanche jersey. Woohoo. All right. And uh, Boston, too, right? But anyway, they were on TV last night. You probably watched them. They lost. Oh, they lost. Okay. So, hockey. So, when uh, Anaheim uh, uh, Disney, Disney bought the Ducks from somewhere and brought them to Anaheim, built a beautiful stadium, and it was sold out. Now, this is Southern California. This is Anaheim, California. The only ice people have ever seen in Southern California is in a glass. They've never skated. They've never played hockey. They've never seen snow or ice. And they bring a team to... But it's sold out because it's Disney. And it's fun. And they got dancing ducks. And they got helicopters flying around inside and dropping out coupons. Dancing uh, cheerleaders uh, shooting t-shirts in the stand. They got music every, every time out. And God, it's like a party. And, I, and then, you know, then uh, uh, Disney got corporate. They start cutting out all the fun. And, you know, the only thing that was left at a hockey game was hockey. It's like, who cares? Two to one after you spend all day to get there and 500 bucks and all you see is a bunch of guys skating around make one goal? It's like boring. You know, it's like watching paint dry, you know? Who cares? And so that didn't work. So finally, uh, they sold, Disney sold to this guy named, uh, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but he's a big, real, real big Orange County guy, billionaire, uh, he owns Broadcom, Sam Welli, Sam Welli bought, and he put all the fun back. Guess what? When Disney had it, it was 17,000 sold out seats, went down to 5,000 seats at the end of Disney's, you know, death march. He comes back in, within the next year, it's sold out again. And I realize it's not about the game. It's not about plumbing. It's not about heating. It's about the show business. So I've got to think about what I have to do. I have to get into show business to get, to get work. I have to get into presentations and videos and, and PowerPoint pro programs. I've got to have a laptop I carry around with me with a, with a, a before and after 
you know, here's how we did this job. I'd be able to walk into a customer and show them how we converted this uh, uh, over the weekend to a blood transfusion uh, uh, center in 24 hours, 48 hours. I gotta show people, because people don't, this doesn't do it, black and white ink on white paper. I've gotta show them, I've gotta take them out to a job site. I've gotta take them out to the field. I've gotta go over to their office and make a, a training seminar on why we should use this water heater versus this one, or here's how we can save money, or you know, energy, energy free, or grow green, or whatever it is, right? I've gotta get into the show business to get people to remember me and want to buy tickets. So I have to refocus how I get business to get better business. So I just want to encourage you to think about that. And, uh, uh, you know, so I've got, to, I've got to seek high margin customers. So I've got a long list here. We'll just skim through it. I want you to check off one or two of these that you want to go after in the future starting Monday. What are you going to do? You know, we're all sitting here learning. Now we got to go do, right? What are we going to do? So we're going to, number one is attack high margin and or loyal customers. Uh, high margin customers, what are we going to do? So high qualifications, performance awards, Maytok, Saytok, VBE, uh, DBE, MBWA, uh, whatever it is, what are you going to do to get higher margin work with great customers that have a high barrier to entry? You know, think of something you could do that you thought about, but you're too chicken to go after, right? So we're gonna think about that. We're gonna think about customers. What kind of customers should I go after? You know, maybe that's something you wanna focus in on. Uh, new markets, maybe I've never got into the Army range. I don't know what facilities are up uh, in your area, wherever you are, whether you're in Provo or Salt Lake or down here. You know, I don't know where you are. Uh, maybe maybe uh, new services. What else could we do? Uh, one of the guys I talked to yesterday has electrical and mechanical company. You know, I don't know if you want to do that, but what else could you do? I know some of you have a plumbing and heating company. Some of you do residential service and commercial projects. So I don't know what else you could do as a feeder to get higher margin work, right? Uh, uh, and so what else? Uh, maybe, what else could I do to add more value? Maybe I need, my next hire needs to be a part-time uh, mechanical engineer who could also do project management. So we could do design build. If we don't have in-house capability for design build, maybe I need to go out and find a mechanical engineer that I could work with on negotiated design build jobs. So what else could I do to make my company stronger, better, and more attractive to a negotiated company that's not gonna shop my price, right? Uh, and so I've gotta differentiate, I've gotta look for new ways. So, so what business are you in is really what I want you to think about. You know, why are you in business? You're not in the mechanical business. You're in the what business? You're in the opportunity business. Your business, allows you to seek opportunities for you to make money. You're not a, when I say what kind of business you're in, you're not a plumbing business. You're in the O business. Your business allows you to create opportunities to make money. What else can you do? I used to, my best friend was a uh, real estate broker. What do you do? I'm in the OB, I'm an opportunity broker. I, 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 whatever I can do to get a sliver, to get a commission, to get a piece, to get ownership, anything I can do. You know, maybe there's an old beat up building in town you could go buy and use your crews to fix it up. Your business allows you to seek that opportunity and end up with an old rental house. Maybe there's a, a joint venture opportunity with a mechanical contractor and you could, plumbing and mechanical. You know, I don't know. Get out of your, your box and think about what else could I do in town, right? Get into the opportunity business, it's like the domino effect. Once you start thinking out of the box, you know, I started a real estate development opportunity. I used to build a lot of projects for developers, and I, and I noticed developers really always looking for money. They never have enough money to do all the work they need. So I said, oh, hey, why don't I, can I be a partner with you? And they go, oh, yeah, sure. We need to have you donate, uh, donate, to invest, you know, 50 grand, 100 grand, whatever it is. I go, okay, I'll just throw in my contractor fee on this job and give me 5% ownership. Okay, 
So you're now a 5% partner. So I, throw, I do the work for 10 or 15 or 20% less, and uh, that's my fee, right? And I get 5%. Well, guess what? I get checks every month from jobs I did 20, 30 years ago. $300, $500, $700. They all add up, right? I get like 15, 20 tax returns from sites I haven't seen in 20 plus years because I threw in 5%, 10%. You know, it's just, what else can you do? You know, what else can you do? You're not in the plumbing or heating business. You're in the get rich business, right? So what else can you do? So a roofing company, I spoke at the John Mansfield Roofing Conference one year, had all their top contractors there. And one of the guys got up and talked about how he built a pallet. He's now the pallet king in his town because they got all these pallets they trash. He started a pallet business. He makes a lot of, he makes like a quarter million dollars just on his net, on his pallet business now. One of the guys we all know, uh, Damien, uh, Ryan might know him, he was, he's a masonry guy, contractor, pretty good reputable out of Ohio. He started a pump business. He didn't like the pumps on the market, so he started a pump. He's now the largest masonry pump company in the United States. He does like 30 million in pumps at some huge markup. Uh, you know, I got an electrical guy out of Colorado. Uh, there's the inside of his, he's making all sorts of stuff now. Uh, electrical guy, he started a home electrical service business to go with his design build negotiated electrical business out of uh, Colorado Springs, right? Uh, solar, solar, uh, well Starbucks. Uh, do you know that every Starbucks has a service contract with a plumbing company? because it breaks all the time, their stuff breaks. One of my contractor clients told me that he was in a Starbucks and all the stuff, the thing was broken, nothing was working. He says, what do I, how do I get coffee? He says, well, we're broke, we're broken, uh, we're down. He says, well, who fixes your stuff? Well, the guy's too busy. He's, I said, who do I call? He now has the account to service all the Starbucks when they have breakdowns in three counties in Central California. He does four million in Starbucks repairs because he got out of the box. He's, he's a mechanical contractor. He doesn't know anything about Starbucks. He fixes the machines and all sorts of stuff now. The booth breaks, the chairs breaks. He fixes everything. He's got five guys running around at 50% markup, right? It's unbelievable. So I could go on and on. Solar, uh, solar opportunity is unbelievable. You just gotta get into it. Think about that. What else? I could tell you a whole story on solar. Uh, uh, you know, cabinets, uh, all sorts of stuff. Road builder, now works for the oil company, et cetera, et cetera, right? Parking lot maintenance. There's so many things you can add on to your business, right? Uh, fixing old buildings, whatever it is, right? So, you know, you're in the opportunity business. You're not in the plumbing, heating business. So think about what else you could do. Okay, so I want you to think about added value, added services, high barrier to entry, better customers. Okay, so now we're going to do... We know what we want to do. Obviously we don't, but we've got to think about it. We need to spend time on that. Well, once we do that, now we have to find the customers. So we have to find customers. So, so which customers are we going to go after? We need a customer attack plan. We need a list of customers that we're going to go see. We're going to go attack new customers. And you've got some old good ones. So you've got the good ones, your current repeat, you want to convert to loyal, and now we got to make a list of new opportunities that you're going to go after. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, meeting with one of my, uh, one of my clients uh, out of Rockford, Illinois. Rockford, Illinois was rated the worst city in America to do business. That's where this guy's general contracting firm is. <laughs> it's 100% union. It's horrible. It's like 60 miles out of Chicago. It's in the cornfields. It's a couple hundred thousand people, but that's where he is. He grew up there, and that's his family and his business and everything. And he's going, what can I do? Because he's, he's only worked on hospitals his whole life. His whole business for 20 years is hospitals. The problem is some big hospital company came in and bought all the local hospitals. So now there's one hospital that owns a bunch of them, right? So all his local contacts are gone. They brought in a new team, and he's going, now what? Last year, he'd lost a lot of money. And he, I went to his office in January. We spent three days working on his business development program, just like we're doing right here. And we just, I just started Googling. Okay, what else can a medical contractor do? Well, they can do food processing. 
So we Googled food processing associations in Ohio. Illinois, I'm sorry. There's like 10 of them popped up. The Midwest Food Processors Association, food engineering, suppliers. The list was like 20 of them. Now, in Utah, it might be a little slimmer, but there's probably a lot of food processing. There's a lot of farming here, right? Somewhere in, 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 in food, right? There's a lot of food. There's a lot of farming and cattle. And, uh, you know, I don't know your state very well, but uh, I used to ski here a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, ski, ski, the ski business, right? You want to get in the ski business, right? So we Googled it, and there's about 500 leads just on page one of Google. Every one of those has over 100 members. I said, get your fanny down to those association, just like Utah, you know, plumbing, heating, contract association. Get your fanny down there and troll around and see who's there and see if it's worth your time. He went down there, and he's going, unbelievable. Who's there? There are so many leads and opportunities there. So he joined and got a booth at the next trade show and got on the board as an associate, and now he's like killing it in food processing. It just takes thinking. What else could you go after? If you're already doing uh, retail stores, you could do medical. If you're already doing medical, you can do food. If you're doing medical, you can do clean rooms and laboratories. See what I mean? And every one of those has a whole group of people that hang in that industry, and you get on the end and you get all their work. But it takes a dedication of time, energy, and a little bit of money. You've got to get out of your chair and go to those events and make it happen, right? Where could you get a high return on time with a little bit of investment of money? You know, the average retail, uh, excuse me, residential contractor uh, in the home improvement business, remodel contractor, spends 5 to 10% of their gross sales in marketing and sales. The average commercial contractor, subcontractor, specialty contractor, spends zero. Well, just, you spend 20 grand a year, you will make another 200 grand a year. I guarantee it. Net. Net. Depends on your sales, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so, so who's on your list? So we gotta build a list. Without a list, I don't know where to market. I gotta go after somebody, right? How do I want to do business? Who am I gonna go after? So you go to these associations and you try them out. If they're, if they're the wrong, there's no value there, move on, go to the next one, the next one. Where do most of the commercial new projects, uh, uh, well, let's just say dental offices. That's a lot of plumbing, right? Where do most of the dental offices leads come from? The dental machinery, you know, the dental equipment companies. They have a meeting every month, every year, in every city of the dental equipment manufacturing companies. Go there. They're, that's where you're going to get your leads. These uh, dentists, they don't know who to call for plumbing. They don't know who to call. They call you if they knew you. But they don't know you because how would they know you? You're not in that market, right? Anyway, get the idea, right? So, you know, if we had four hours, we could sit down and figure it out, each one of you individually, right? Okay, so, so you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to focus on? What are you going to aim at? What's your plan here? And, and what happens is, when you go to the driving range, you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. So if you don't have a focus, you're never going to make it. You know, yesterday I was joking around about how much money you want to make. 6%, 6% of what? Whatever I can get. Well, that's not a goal. I want to get five new customers in this market by the end of the year who give us a million, two million, half a million, whatever amount of work, right? At this margin, right? So uh, if you aim on purpose with all your energy, you'll be surprised at what you can, what you can, what can happen. So the question is, what targets are you going to go after? What targets? So that's the key here. So what I want to do then is create a spreadsheet of targets uh, down here on the bottom right of page three, I want to create a target list and a tack plan. So I want to have a plan. I want to aim at something big, right? You like that? Any golfers here? There's no gimmies, right? Right? So I want to create a target plan of who am I going to go after? So who am I going to go after? So I want to make a list of sales targets and goals and how many I want and how much, what's the sales I can get with each customer. So I take my list, I've got my current 
customers. So I've got loyal customers, I've got repeat customers, and I've got past customers. So I've already got those. So you fill in the blank. Who are they? I want to list them out. Joe, St- Sam, Dave, Acme Construction, Ac- you know, General this, what ABC this, right? So I, I want to list them, and I want to put them in order, and I want to, how much work do I get from them? Gross and net from each one. So I want to put them in order of who's the best for us. Uh, and you could, ease, you could also rank them by, you know, ease of business. So however you want to do it, right? But I want to have a list of my current customers that I want on my target list. And then I want to add my new customers. These are new customers I'm going to go after. These are my high margin customer targets. So I've got to think about what we've talked about over the last 20 minutes and make a list of new new opportunities to seek, new customer targets, new markets, new, new things I haven't tried. And I want to put it in, and then if I want to get really specific, I could break it down by pre-specified, pre-qualified short lists. Uh, some of them require high qualifications. You know, I can't get in with Coca-Cola unless I have this. I can't get in with the Army range uh, majors unless I have this. You know how you get a, a job from the Army Corps? You get pre-qualified and you, you, they rank you based on qualifications and price is 20 to 50% of the reason they hire you. The first part is all the qualifications, so I gotta fill in all the blanks. So that would be a high qualification requirement. Performance, some companies award on performance, uh, uh, et cetera. Maybe, maybe you have a competitive advantage, you're the specialist in blood transfusion work over the weekend. Uh, maybe, maybe you have technical qualifications. Maybe you know how to work on this kind of you know, energy efficient building uh, automation kind of things, whatever it is, right? Mechanical especially, right? Uh, maybe you're LEED certified, maybe you're green, maybe you're whatever you are, right? Uh, and, uh, or maybe it's difficult, weekend nights, high risk, hanging off wires, whatever it is, kind of work, right? So think about it. Now, I'm not saying you have to go after all of these. I just want you to pick a lane and go after it, right? What are you going to go after? That's the key here. What are you going to go after? So hopefully you don't go home and go, God, I need to do something. I just don't know what. I'll wait till next year. you got to start, right? There's no time like the present, you know, uh, to get going here, okay? So you understand that. So I've got an entire spreadsheet on this. Uh, when, if you email me, just type in Utah Business Development, Sales, whatever you want to call it, and I will send you my Excel template. I've got, I've got five templates on how to do this, uh, on all my, all my templates. So I don't have them in here, just, just stuck the, the sample there, okay? So just, my email's down at the bottom. Just send me an email, and uh, I will gladly send you that. Okay, so uh, what time is it here? 10.54. What should I cover next? Um, okay, let, let's do this. Any questions so far? Uh, you know, I'm a GC. Any questions of me? Might want to throw out a question or two. How would I? Yes, yes, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned everybody should know uh, how their generals do business with the owner. Know what contracts they have. Right. I mean, obviously, some of that stuff won't come until you create a lot better relationship with them. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you just ask them. When they ask you to bid, you say, is this, are, is this, a, uh, is this a public bid? Is this a private bid? Uh, how many bidders are you going against? Is it lump sum or is it negotiated? Uh, is it cost plus with a G max? You know, how, how is this job? Just ask them. They, they know. They're just not telling you. But they, ju- you know, and some of these guys, they have their standard... I square foot, or you know, you guys all see nice square foot, right? They send out the bid requests, or what's the other ones you guys are seeing, like Blue Book or whatever. You know, they send out their request. What'd you say? It's the I square foot. I square foot or whatever. They send out requests for bid, and uh, you don't. Know, they just send it out. The estimator really isn't thinking about that. The estimator just wants to get coverage. You know, three, four, five bids per trade, right? That's what they want, because that's how they get incentivized. But that doesn't help you. What helps you is what kind of job is it, 
And then if it's, if it's going to be a closed list, you need to know that. And then you've got to come in with, into the office to the awarding person and, and talk to them about, you know, what's it going to take to get this job before I just give you a price? Is there, you're looking for value engineering, you're looking for faster schedule, you're looking for, you know, one time I did a job for Gateway Computer when they were still around. They had to move in in like six months on a 120,000 square foot brand new facility. Uh, ground up. It's like 10 million. They had a, the, the landlord who hired us, developer, the same guy I mentioned earlier uh, when I did the phone deal, uh, says, Headley, we got to get this done by this date. It's 100000 a month loss rent. 100000 or yeah, it was like 100000 that was a rent, 100000 a month, right? He says, we got to get them in in six months or eight months, whatever it was. He says, I don't care what it costs, you got to get them done. It costs another 200 grand, who cares? So I went out to the subs I knew had the most people, the biggest crews. I didn't go out to Joe Cheap, who had four guys in a truck, you know. I went out to the companies. So, so they don't know why I'm calling them. Uh, so if they ask, they say, yeah, you're on the short list. I need companies that can perform. It's all about speed, not price. So you don't know. You would have never known had you not asked. And I don't, I don't really have a reason to tell you. You know, I mean, I guess I could have, but I had to get two or three bids because my developer wanted a couple bids, but not six. So then I sit down with the developer and I go over all the bids and I say, you know, SR, they've got like 20 guys, 30 guys. They, they can get this job done. They've done a bunch of really fast track. Great. Okay, let's, yeah, I know they're a little bit higher, but let, yeah, let's go with them. And then here's the electrician. Here's the, here's the concrete guy or whatever, right? So, yeah, so I just ask, you know, when you get a request for bid, uh, if, if you don't, you know, just, just give them a call. What, is this a lump sum? Is this a public opening? How, what kind of job is this? I mean, it takes a little more work. You've got to actually call them or email them. It's like, oh, my God, I actually have to do something to get work rather than just turn in a price, right? Before I invest an estimator for several days, I want to know if it's a good use of my time, right? How many other bidders you get and how many people you're bidding against, you know, how are they going to open the bids? You negotiate anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you want, your goal is to improve your bid hit win ratio by choosing the right jobs to bid. So the more things you know, the better you can do. Right? Good. Qu any other questions? Okay, I'll just keep going. I'm going to just I'm going to skim through some stuff here. I want to keep rolling here. Uh, let me see. Where am I on my schedule here? I don't even know. So 11 o'clock. So. Let's see, uh, I'm about half through this, so. Okay, I'll just, I'll just keep going quickly. All right, so let's turn the page, uh, page four, okay? And uh, let's talk about how to get work, okay? So uh, how many of you said, anybody here ever done any estimating? Yeah, most of us, right? How many of you said, when I grow up, I want to be an estimator? Uh, how many of you said, when I grow up, I want to stay inside all day, I want to look at the computer, never see the sun, Blame for missed items and never get any credit for anything. How many want to be an estimator? Yeah, that's a tough job, isn't it? So there's three parts of getting work, right? The goal is number one, accuracy. The first goal of estimating is accuracy. That's the number one accountability responsibility of an estimator is accuracy. Not get work. One of my clients from Reno, different Reno client, uh, she, she sent me a long email last, yesterday afternoon. And she says, I pay my my project manager slash estimator on gross sales, percentage of sales. I said, what are you, stupid? Should be on net profit, right? She, she sent me another email later arguing with me. Well, this guy works really hard. He should get a percentage of sales. I said, fine. Just give me your bank account and let's just get it over with. You know, I mean, how stupid are you? I didn't say that. Well, I kind of did, but not really. You know, it's like, no! You pay them on net profit of the company, not on, you know, or however you're set up, right? That's a whole other 12-hour discussion. But accuracy is the key, not getting work. Their job is to get the accuracy. The company's job is to get the work. So next is sales. Who in your company is the salesperson, the sales manager, the presenter, the negotiator? Who's best to negotiate with customers in your company. Convince them to use you, your estimator or you. 
it's probably you. Now, if you've got a big company, it might be the president or the vice president. I don't know how many big companies we've got here that are doing 50 million or some big number, 30, 40 million, right? But most of us are really involved at the get work. And we've got to get, make that a part of our job. And then lastly, it's marketing. Marketing is improving your bid odds, creating a perception of value, putting the word out there, getting in front of people, uh, you know, donut delivery, whatever your thing is, right? Get them to want to use you, right? Uh, advertising, um, trade shows, marketing, whatever you do, right? Logos, images, et cetera, right? So that's, that's marketing. So which one should your estimator do? Which one should you be in charge of? You should be in charge of two and get some help for three. You could have your office manager. Somebody in your company should do the marketing part of your company, but you just direct it. You're the director, but then get an assistant to do the work. Update the website. The reason is the web, your website's not updated because nobody's in charge of it. Well, you are, which means you don't have time. You get your office manager to do it. They need to be in charge of upgrading your marketing materials, your website. You just have to direct them. You're the marketing director, okay? So, so the old way, uh, uh, so, so, so one of the goals is we have, to, we have to want to present our proposals in person. So I know you can on every job, but as often as possible, you want to present in person, or you want to do a follow-up in person. You can convince people in person. Over the phone, they tell you what they want you to hear just to get, off, get you off the phone. And in email, they just lie to you, right? Right? They don't never tell you the truth on the email. Well, you're really close. Sorry, we didn't give you the job. But I gave it to my brother-in-law, who's done the last 20 jobs for you. Thanks for the check bid. Now, they don't say that, but translation, right? So anyway, it, the more you can get in person, you can give them reasons to hire you. In writing, it's really hard to convince people to hire you. What's your price? What's your price? They're taking your bid and they're giving it to somebody else and saying, can you throw all this in? Oh yeah, sure, okay. So it's just facts. There's no emotion, there's no reasoning, right? So I want to get into show business. Don't forget, I'm in the show. I gotta show them why us, right? Visual, I got, and then I wanna follow up. So if I follow up, I wanna follow up with reasons. So what do I wanna do? I wanna leave a message and I wanna say, hey, you know, I, I, I know, you're probably not ready to talk to us yet, but you know, I was thinking about that job we gave you a proposal on the other day. I, uh, congratulations on the award. Uh, I was looking through my proposal and I found five ways I think we can finish faster and save you significantly money. Is there any way I could stop in and see you? Now they might call you back on that, right? Versus, how do I look? How do I look? Turn to someone on your right or left and say, how do I look? How do I look? Turn back and say, cut your price, idiot, and you look better. Okay, anyway, maybe that's a little rude, right? I'm known for that. Anyway, so follow up. So, so the key is to bug them till they buy or die. That's the key. So you've got to be part of your tracking system on your bid, you know, your, when you go through all your bids, is who's following up, who's following up, who's following up. Well, I called them. That doesn't count. Who went and saw them? Who went to their office? Who, who got in their face? Who got a meeting with them? That's the key. And if your name's on the accountability list, you better go do it, right? It's more important to meet than to bid, right? So anyway, uh, so I look at estimators. People always say, how do I get my estimator to get more work? Well, number one, they're not salespeople. They're price people. Got the wrong person trying to get you work. The only way they get work is by cutting their price. So they want a commission, they cut their price, right? That's no good, right? So they're not follow-up people. They're not people people. They're not presenter people. They're not uh, negotiators or closer, and they're not salespeople. So don't confuse busy with results. That's the key. So start with accuracy. We've got to know our numbers. Anyway, I could spend all day on this, but I'm just going to... You know, I got to know my numbers. So the key here is uh, know my numbers. So I've got to know how many man hours, crew hours, it takes to do things. How many hours should it take to do a toilet? 
to do a sink, to rough in this, to run water lines, sewer line, to run overhead, underground, high ceiling, low ce- I gotta know how many man hours per lineal foot, per unit, per square foot, however you do it, right? That's the key. Man hours per quantity, crew hours per quantity. And then I've gotta give my foreman the, the goal, and I've gotta give them a weekly report every week on where they are. That way they'll hit the number. And if I don't have the software to make that happen, that's got to be another really, really high priority. Because otherwise you're bidding blind and hope it works. I call that the blind man method. Oh, God, I hope it works out. Yeah, I think we should have three guys there for a week. Okay, let's bid like that. Uh, I don't know, probably the underground. I probably can do 100 feet, of, 100 feet a day. Let's try that. See, that, that's just a pure guess. I have a company I work with in uh, Montana and up in that area. I've got about 100 electricians. Their goal is 2% accuracy, bid versus actual. That's their whole number one priority in their company is 2% accuracy, bid versus actual. And they work really hard. They have an all-day meeting with all their estimators. They have nine estimators. All-day meeting once a month with all their estimators to go through all their jobs, bid versus actual, and adjust their, their bid rates. So they come in at accuracy, right? That's the key. Okay, so there's a long list there. That's a whole other program we don't have time for. Okay, so what do we, next thing we want to track is our scorecard of how well we're doing as a bidder. So we want to track our bid-hit-win ratio. So on my business development template, I promised you, is my bid-hit ratio tracking template. So it's all the jobs and how we did on the bid and whether we got first, second, or third, and then what our bid-hit ratio is. And then I want to sort my bid-hit ratio by customer. So I, break, I sort it by customer. Oops, sorry, went too far. So I got all my customers, and who do I get work from and who don't I get work from? Then I want to focus on them as my top priority. If I've only got time for one lunch a week, let's focus on the best, not the worst. You know, I want to take care of the good ones and get the threes, three to one up to two and a half to one. I want to make sure they get taken care of. So that's on the top of my list. The guys down at the bottom, seven, eight to one, those are repeat. They don't use me very often, unless, unless I'm stupid low, right? So I want to sort. And then I want to sort it by city and job type and job size and, and, and competition. And, you know, the more knowledge I know, the better I can decide yes, no, bid, no bid, right? And who I want to go after. Okay, so I want, the goal is to then improve my fishing, my bid hit, my win ratio. You know, my hours on the water to collect and fish, right? How many of you fish? Anybody here fish? Yeah? So it's my, it's my fish to beer ratio or fish to, fish to boat ratio, right? So I want a bid hit. Oh, there's, there's one. You guys seen that? Original contract change order. Anyway, okay, so what I want to do is, is, is figure out my fishing ratio, uh, my bid hit win ratio. Uh, and so then I sit down and ask myself, how can I improve my bid hit win ratio? First of all, I gotta know what it is and which customers are good and which are bad. Which job types are good and which are bad. Which job size I'm best at. Which markup I'm best at. What my competition is stealing from me or getting and I'm not getting. So, so I gotta have good information. So I've got, so every uh, once a month, my estimator brings me the official bid hit ratio report, updated every, every Monday, or uh, the first Monday of the month. It's mandatory. The estimator brings me that. Now, if you're the estimator, get your staff person to do it. Get your office manager, your accounting manager, get somebody to do this for you. You can do it on a yellow pad, I don't care. Put it on Excel, whatever you wanna do. So we wanna get our bid hit ratio improved. We've got, first we gotta know what it is, and we gotta come up with ways. So, you know, we gotta sit down and come up with a marketing plan to make that happen, right? And so, uh, we turn in our bids, and we call up and we say, how do I look? That's like the dumbest thing ever asked. Never say, did you get the results yet? How do we look? That's just an invitation to lower your price, right? That's just not gonna happen. So, when you, when you haven't heard, it's because they're negotiating with somebody else. That's just it, get over it. They're not, they don't want you. You call and they go, oh, you're so close, sorry. No, you need to be the first one in. You need to give them reasons to hire you. 
You know, if you wasted all that time and don't go after it, what are you doing? If you're spending a week putting a bid together, you need to spend at least a day to go get it, right? You know, that, don't you think that's a good return on time? Absolutely, right? So we want to get there in front, and uh, we, gotta, we, we want to try to get in front and show them why, tell them about your company, present in per person, and uh, remember, the pers pur purpose of your bid, the purpose of your bid is, is what? The purpose for your bid is bait. Your bid is bait to get them to bite. It's not the end, it's the beginning. It's the bait. Now we've got to reel them in. So think of that. Your bid is bait to get a meeting, to get the opportunity to negotiate. We're not bidding to get work. We're bidding to get a meeting, to get an opportunity to present why you. So what's more important, a perfect bid or follow-up? The key is present in person and follow-up, right? Don't just sit there in your computer and send an email, how do I look? You know, it's get out of your chair and go see them. Now, I can say this a hundred times, are you going to do anything? So when I get a bid as a general contractor, and for, you know, this is a job I did in San Clemente, is uh, I was the owner and developer and contractor. So, you know, I want to use the good subs. So I send out a proposal, you know, sort of the same question again, Ryan. Uh, you know, uh, it's my, I own the building. I'm going to own it. And I'm, I've got a lease on it. I've got, I got it leased out. I'm not going to hire a lowballer. You know, yeah, I want it as low as I can, but I want it, I don't want to have problems. I, I got a lease. I got a move in date. So I, so I get the bid. I ask for solicit concrete bids, and I get this one for a million two twenty from a concrete contractor, guy I've used, and this is the proposal. Pretty enticing, huh? It's, doesn't that just make you want to buy from that guy? No. There's 51 exclusions. I gotta spend two hours reading the exclusions. How about just says, I got all the work, a million two, done. And then we sit down and we talk about what he doesn't have. But this has got every exclusion known to man. He's given me 51 reasons not to hire him. Or to give this list to his competitor, right? He's given away his negotiating tool on his proposal. He should say, I've got all the rebar, well, all the welding, all the, all the walls, all the slabs, and all the truck wells. I got it, period. I don't have any site work. That's what it should say for a million two twenty. And then I, and, and, and then I'll say, and I'm going to call him up and say, hey, Joe, uh, come on in here. I want to go through everything. Make sure you got everything before I award you the job. But he gave me 51 reasons not to hire him. And a whole bunch of other stuff over here I'm not going to read. I'm going to have to send to my attorney now. He made my life miserable. That's a sales tool? No, that's, well, I won't use the us word again. Okay, last but not least on this idea uh, is that's a winning proposal. Now, how do I look? It's not always about your price. So, so another thing, these are kind of out of order, but just kind of something about, think about your image. Uh, make your image an asset. When you show up on a job and all your guys look like this, you're going, eh, schlock. Eh, they're probably not very organized. They're probably not that good, if that's what your crew looks like. Anybody's crew look like that? I won't tell you who in the room here, I, that's their crew because I went on your website. No, I won't do that. I'm not saying they're bad guys. There's another crew. Eh, it's a little better. At least they have the same shirt on. If they got four different color hats, they got no, no organizational systems. Uh, they got one guy with tennis shoes. That's illegal. That's un, you can't, you gotta have hard-soled shoes uh, on my jobs, right? Hard-soled shoes. Uh, how about these guys? I love these guys, steadfast. They're really good, right? Well, at least they all got boots on. No shorts on my jobs, right? It's uh, not safe, right? And uh, I don't know what the red shirts are and the green shirts. Uh, now, these guys look good. They're in the sales business. They're trying to win you over. So I don't know. Maybe this guy. Maybe that's you. I don't know. Anyway, so think about how you present your company. What do you do to present your company? So we show up at a trade show. We're all dressed alike. We've got a beautiful, nice little image. Uh, you know, we all got our khakis and our red shirts on or whatever we got. I don't know. Some of, the, some of the guys out here in the booth earlier today and yesterday, you know, they look sharp. They all look the same. Some of the guys just showed up in their, you know, Levi's and, what, you know, whatever, ripped shirt. So, you know, we, we want to look like a pro. 
So, uh, you know, you want all your equipment spick and span, looking great. Uh, it's very important. Uh, if you look good, I'm going to assume you're good. Uh, uh, you want your guy, you want to have nice little signs that you've got on every job. Uh, you want to have a nice uh, website. You want to have a little laptop presentation. So if I say, hey, Ryan, uh, can you give me a little overview of your company? Yeah, hold on here. Let me whip it out, right? You got your little iPad with you or whatever you got, right? And uh, let's go. And then when you go out to the job, everybody's got their, their vests on, their hard hat. There's no, look at all the guys. Everybody in the whole crew. Everybody's got the same color, same hat. Boom. We all look great, right? You look good, you get hired more. You look sloppy, they think you're cheap. And I'm not going to hire you on a, on a really, really good job. Okay? So think about your improvement. Okay. Uh, so I, I wanted to show you this. It's not on the work. Oh, yeah. Bottom right. Okay. Bottom right. This is just a little negotiating tactic I threw on here just for the heck of it. This is what I call my markup distribution plan. So when I work with contractors, in this company, we have to average 15% markup to achieve our goals of a million five gross profit and 10 million in sales. So we're not trying to make 15%. We're trying to bring in a million five with 10 million in sales. Now, take off a zero. I don't care. But you get the concept, OK? So what we do is we sit down and we break apart that 15%. So you can see on the little jobs, the $25,000 jobs, I, wanna, I need to charge a higher margin because on the million dollar jobs, I need to be cheaper because I'm bidding against bigger contractors. So I need to do a variable markup distribution program to make me competitive and still make money. So I don't know, uh, this, this takes a while to work through on the the blueprint I promised you yesterday, this is on one of the templates. It's on the financial click on that. But uh, you play the game and you make a decision of how you're going to adjust your markup. Now, I don't know if I'm a 15% contractor. I've ever go down to 5%. It's pretty low, but it's just to show you the idea, right? Anybody here using a variable markup system? Uh, yeah, you've got to. I know Brian and I have talked about it more than once. And uh, I don't know, has it, has it worked for you? You definitely got to bid the bigger jobs cheaper, right? And then you got to make it up because you still got to make your 15 or 10 or whatever you got to make, right? So we got to, if we're going to bid a job, if you need to make 15, we got to use 10 to get the big, big job. We got to get 20 or 30 on something else, right? So it blends out. So we, we got to change our markup strategy. So if we had, uh, you know, two more days, we could work on that, all right? So it's just, I just wanted you to think about that. Okay, let's close out this, uh, any questions on that? All right, so let's close out this section with the little sales program, the last page, five, and then we'll uh, take a little break here. I don't know if the break's out there or not, I think it is, but uh, we'll take 10 more minutes and we'll go through this and we'll come back. Okay, so, uh, so I want you to think about, you're, you're in the construction business, you're in the plumbing and heating business, mechanical business, you're really in the sales business. The, the business you're in is a sales business. The better sales you are, the more money you make. The less sales, the cheaper you have to be. So when I say sales, that's like spend time with your customer. Set yourself apart from your competition. Differentiate your company. Go after higher margin work, uh, prequal, specifications, testing, whatever your thing is, right? Uh, and I've got to sell sell more than low price to increase my margin with how to win more work with higher margins i've got to get into the marketing and sales business business development right i've got to invest and so business is tough but you know i don't care who you are everybody in here is in the people business you're in the people business you're in the face business you're in the face-to-face -face business and you're selling a relationship Relationships are built on trust, trust. If you do good work, I trust that you'll do good work. It doesn't mean I'm going to use you unless you're competitive. But if, but if I know you on a face-to-face, one-on-one basis because we've spent personal time together, I now have a trust. I now have an understanding of who you are and your integrity and your honesty. 
Doing good work counts. That gets you to the next level, which is negotiated, trusted relationship, right? So you're selling a relationship. So there's three things we offer, or more, three or four, right? So uh, business development, marketing, and sales tool, page five. First thing we offer is price. What we really offer is different. Different. That's, you get hired because you're different. That's really what it is. It's either your price or a bunch of other things. So it's different. You don't get hired because you're cheap. Well, you're cheap, that makes you different. You get hired and you get a little extra nod or a nudge or negotiation if you're perceived different, better, right? More trusted, more special, higher qualifications, different. So just remember different, different. So the tool is price. That's the simple one. That takes no effort. That takes a turn in a bid and hope they call. So what's next? Different, different. Well, price is the first differentiator. I probably should have put that first. So differentiating, so what do I do? I have a better product or a better service. I'm faster, uh, more qualified, uh, my crew is more trained, et cetera, right? So that's, that's a difference. Maybe I've got a specialty in a market, a niche, a type of work, hospital work, high rise work, dog houses, patio covers, whatever you're good at, right? Maybe, I'm, maybe I do really hard jobs. One of my clients is a freeway builder and he's really good at the really tough jobs, right over an intersection or over a freeway or you know, tight corners kind of thing where there's cars all day. He goes after the really tough jobs. Uh, or maybe it's a very high barrier to entry. Uh, uh, it's really hard to get in. So it's, you're different. Or, okay, those are all great. They're all tough. They all take an investment. Or relationship. That takes a, that's tough too. That takes an, in, an energy, an investment of time. I gotta get out of my office and go see people and get out of my comfort zone, right? And that takes me to build trust. I've gotta date my customers. It's like dating, right? <laughs> it's hard, it's scary, right? I'm chicken, I don't want to call on them. So how do we build that relationship? You know, on the first four, you can think about what I need to do, but the relationship one, let's just think about that. How do I build trust? First thing is, they've got to be aware of your company. If they've never heard of you, you've got to hit them. You've got to buy a job, you've got to do a cheap job, you've got to send them stuff, you've got to keep trying, you've got to keep pounding, right? You don't give up. So they've got to be aware of you. Once they're aware of you, then uh, familiar and aware, then we've got to, then the key is frequency. Frequency. So sales and building relationships is not a one-time event. It's not do one job and hope it happens. It's continual attack. How many of you got date, dated and married on the same night? One guy? <laughs> just, just joking. How many of you took a while to get to that, to build that relationship, right? It's the same with customers. They gotta get to know you. They gotta understand you as a person, right? It's the same thing. So uh, I can give you several examples of subcontractors so, that built relationships with me, even though I never dealt with them. I had a company, I had six project managers. I had three estimators, six project managers, and 25 superintendents, and 150 guys in the crew. But I always said, let's make sure we use George Mann cabinets, and let's make sure we use Mark Wallach flooring. Now, why do I like those guys? And BDB Electrical, and Bob Phillips Plumbing. If in doubt, let's try to use those guys. Why? Because they had a relationship with me. They, went, they came in the back door. Mark Wallach would show up in the office, go around, see all the project managers, he's a flooring guy, it's a towel, and he would do his work with the PMs, and the estimators, and then he would drop off a little gift for me on my desk. It'd be a bottle of uh, Pinot Noir from Sonoma County from Bella Glos Vineyard, and I go, whoa, that's cool. Well, first of all, he, he, he knew that, uh, Dave, we're, we'll take a break in like five minutes. Uh, we'll, we're gonna, uh, he knew that I liked Pinot Noir from the Sonoma Valley. 
uh, Sonoma Coast, and uh, Bella Glos is one of the best premier vineyards up there. Another guy would bring me in uh, Shrixon XR golf balls that were orange. He, always, he, he, he didn't bring me top flights. He didn't bring me Pro Vs. He brought me Shrixon. Why? Because he knew I played Shrixon. Now, he never played golf with me, but he found out what, was, what I liked. It's kind of like with your spouse. You don't give them something they don't want, right? You find out what they want, and that's what you give them. You know, I've been married a long time. I don't even guess anymore. I just ask my wife, hey, what do you want for Christmas or for your birthday? You know? He goes, don't get me any of that stupid stuff you buy me. Go talk to Roxanne at this store. Okay, I'll go see Roxanne. You know? So I, I, I bring them what they want. So over the time, he would create relationship with me just by dropping off little fun things that enticed me and made me think about him. USC football mug or a, you know, a Anaheim Ducks pop, puck or you know, fun stuff, right? So the key is find out what they want and then be there frequently, and I like four times a year. I'm a four times a year guy. So uh, I, I believe in that. So think about what I can do. So emails, eh. Email's a tool to set up a meeting. It's not a relationship builder. How many of you got married to your spouse and you only did emails with them? No, you gotta go see them, right? Take them to dinner, take them to the movies, get to know them, take them to a ball game, whatever you do, right? Uh, and so phone calls are tools. And I don't really think they, you know, they're tools. Those are all tools to get you in the door. So what I have to do is think about building a relationship. So I want to build a face-to-face -face relationship three or four times a year and build a schmooze plan with my top 10, top 20 customers uh, of face-to-face of, of -face meetings. So what I want to do is set up, have a list of my customers, and I want to continually go try and meet with them on a regular basis and have a face-to-face -face meeting, and I'm trying to date my customers. What I call face mail. Face mail, in their face, face to face, date my customers, and you know, taking them something they like, bringing them a book, bringing them a gift, uh, bringing them a nice logo shirt from the masters if they're a golfer, those kinds of things. And I, you can buy that stuff online. You know, find out what they like and go do it, right? So that's the key here. And then from there I can ask for referrals. Uh, I can, I, first I gotta, I gotta earn them but then I can ask for them, <coughs> and I've got to have a referral plan. I've got to have a referral plan to ask for referrals. So on the page there, I've got a little simple sales system here, page five. So first of all, I want to make a list of who my customers are, and I want to commit myself as a busy business owner to 12 activities a year, a week, 12 a week. Now, whatever your number is, so my first goal is I try to go out and have two meetings a week with customers, face-to-face -face meeting. Ball game, dinner meeting, golf, lunch, breakfast, whatever it takes. I want to have, I want to commit two a week, two a week. If you can only do one, one, one's better than none. Two a week. Then I want to try to do one sales call a day, one phone call a day. Hey Joe, hey, thanks for letting us bid your job. So any way we can work with you, let me know. I'd love to come and talk to you. We've got a whole bunch of value engineering ideas. One a day. And then I try to send out one handwritten note. Where's my little, I've got these little postcards made. And I, and I try to send out one a day, five a week. Just thanks, just anything. Send them anything. Send them a birthday card. Send them a handwritten note. Hey, thanks. Hey, send them a picture and you write on the back of it, hey, I took this picture of the job. Things are going good, thanks. You know, anything you can do to build a relationship, right? Just like you do with your sweetie, right? I was sending my wife little notes. And then for the company, I wanna have a company-wide program. So I'm still gonna to try to have the meeting with my top 24, I call it score 24. I'm gonna, and I have a mailing program. I try to mail out a postcard or something once a quarter, something to keep them aware frequency of our company. And then I try to go after how many new targets a month. Two, four, six, eight, your number. You decide. So I don't just get stuck in a rut. I try to always add new customers. So that's just a simple plan. Simple plan. So, you know, that, that makes positive sales growth. So the question is, what are you going to do? Right? What are we going to do? So we want to build a success, success system 
that works for you. So, so, you know, instead of hitting all over the place, let's get focused and pick your top 24 customers. Let's decide how many sales calls, face-to-face -face calls or, or appointments, meetings you're gonna have. One a, day, one a week, one a day, one every three days, whatever you do. How many new customers are you gonna go after on a regular basis, four a month, one a month? How many, time, are you, how many times are you gonna hand write a note and how many times are you gonna mail out to your group? To your group. So it's really simple. That is a very low cost, high return program. Now if you wanna add golf memberships or basketball tickets to the Utah Jazz or, you know, now you're adding some money. But it's small money versus getting a couple jobs. It's like so simple to set yourself. I gotta tell you, as a general contractor, with 50 million a year in work for 20 years or more, I never got a thank you card, ever. I never got a birthday gift. I never got a anniversary gift. I never got nothing from my subcontractors. The only thing I got was a change order request. That's the only thing I ever get. They're whining about one of my project managers not approving their change orders, or when do I, when do I get paid? All it took was one little differentiating factor and you'd have all my work. I sent out a request to invest in one of my development projects, uh, $25,000 shares. If you want to invest 25 grand, let me know. It was a really nice project, 200,000 square feet industrial park. We made a lot of money on it. I sent out to my 50 top subcontractors that I had a little bit of a relationship with, I got zero response, zero. If you would have, if you would have invested 25 grand, you would have got the plumbing for the job. What do you think the plumbing contract was on that job? It's like 400 grand. 25 grand gets you 400. That's how, I don't wanna degrade plumbing contractors. But I mean, it's like, just be, just do it. Just do something. Well, I don't know, 25 grand, that's kind of, okay, I'll just bid it. Okay, you don't get it, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, so just set yourself apart. So what I wanna do is I wanna have an ongoing uh, uh, target list like I told you before, I want to have my top customers, I want to have the ones I have relationships, my repeats I'm trying to convert, and then I want to have my current customers, past, and my new targets, and of course my referring parties. So I want to identify, I want to create a list of the, all of my customers, and then I want to make sure I attack them. So if I'm doing mailing, I can hit them all once a quarter, if I can send out a postcard or something. But if I want to go see them, uh, so I list them all out and I rank them in order of dollar of value, and return on energy. Some are a PIA, pain in my assets, right? Uh, and so then I've got you know, January, February, March, and I keep track. And so over time, I wanna go see, attack, touch, start at the top, go down, and don't forget the new, so many people on a monthly basis, right? So that's all I ask, it's pretty simple. So uh, on the next page, six is a, uh, Sample uh, uh, target tracking, just a sample. Uh, this has got my, uh, uh, you know, this is how I keep track of my bids and leads. I've got my potential jobs, current proposals, submitted proposals, uh, pre-construction, and then I've got my sales target tracking, who I'm gonna go see. And the key is follow-up. See the right column, follow-up. We turn in a bid, we need follow-up every week. We need to attack, attack, attack. No follow-up, no return. High follow-up, high return, right? And then on the bottom is my sales award tracking template where I track, uh, you know, my goal is, in this example, uh, I left my clicker in the file over here, but uh, on, the, on the first call, uh, uh, so the goal is 12 million, see at the top, 12 million, and the gross profit is a million five, that's my goal. It's not a percentage, it's a number. So I've got my goal, cumulative, 12 million is a million a month in sales, and then my gross profit is 125 a month. So every month I just put in all my awards and my estimated profit for that job, and I, I keep track, make sure I stay on track. So that keeps me focused on hitting the ultimate goal of 12 million, million five. So every month I know where I am. So you gotta do this, you gotta do this.